op when the police came round, I assumed they were special branch. And I've had a special branch visit me in the house before, you know, for sure. wanting intelligence or complaining about some intelligence I provided. I've had a special branch in my home at midnight where I used to live in Aylesbury. And well, the police officer knocked at the door. I, I, my natural instinct was to invite them in because I work with law enforcement. I'm a good guy. I'm a white hat. So, you know, my first instinct was to come in and have a cup of tea. GO2 is the German operation in London. goes back to the end of World War II. A GO2 asset in the cabinet office had ordered my arrest knew about the nuclear warhead and wanted me out of the way by very indirect means with the National Security Agency. And I got, well, by the Sunday afternoon, it was clear that, that whilst I'd been in custody, the nuke had been smuggled out. Uh, Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst is the German agency set up at the end of World War II. GO2 is their London operation. All right. So General Operations 2, it's based in a very discreet part of uh, MI6 headquarters at Vauxhall Cross. Hi, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot and today I am very excited to have a very interesting guest and a really lovely man. <laughs> We're here with Michael Shrimpton. He's the author of Spy Hunter, which is a, a wonderful book that I've been reading and found that he has some very interesting things to say in regard to history that relates to Britain, the United States, and really the rest of the world, but specifically also the relationship with a very secret organization within Germany. And we're going to go into all of that and see what, what Michael has to say. So Michael, welcome. It's, it's wonderful to be here with you. Well, thank you for inviting me onto the show. M Merry Christmas to you and your viewers. Oh, thank you very much, and to you as well. We are here in Britain, and you are a, a barrister. Uh, I suspended at the moment, uh, not able to practice my day job, banged up in prison for something I hadn't done. But, exactly. Yes. And, and, and we want to start off with that, actually. Yes. And uh, what I would like you to do is talk about how, how this came about, because I think it's fascinating that a government would actually put you up on charges for, <laughs> for, for warning them uh, about a possible you know, so-called terrorist attack or attack of any kind. I mean, governments, one would think, would have a hotline and need people to yes. <laughs> report this sort of thing. And especially someone of your stature, a barrister, because yes. at the time you were, and in, I guess perhaps in the future you will be reinstated, I don't know. Well, I, I hope to be reinstated next year. I, I, still, I still have my wig. I'm still a barrister. I'm on interim suspension. Yes. But the, the prosecution case is falling apart and uh, anticipate uh, fresh appeals in the new year. All right. So at this moment, let's start with your arrest, yes. uh, maybe set the scene by, by telling yes. about the arrest, and I think it was shocking to you. It was. <laughs> it was so certainly. outlandish. It was completely outlandish. When, when word got around the Intelligence Committee, you know, some friends of mine, people who knew me in the Intelligence Committee, were falling about laughing. Yes. It was, it was such an extraordinary cock-up. But of course it wasn't a cock-up, it was deliberate, and it came from GO2 assets in the Cabinet Office. Now, people think that Britain's a functioning democracy or not. Uh, Kerry, uh, in practice, the government is run from the cabinet office, and that includes quangos, it includes the judiciary, it includes the police. Uh, and once the cabinet office order an arrest, then the arrest will go down. Uh, most chief constables report into the cabinet office. The Crown Prosecution Service, which controls criminal prosecutions in this country, does. And uh, uh, so most government ministers are just lightweights, they're, they're figureheads. They don't actually run their departments. The departments are run by the senior civil servant, who's normally called the permanent secretary. But I, I, I absolutely was not expecting to be arrested. In fact, I'd invited the op. When the police came round, I assumed they were special branch. And I've had a special branch visit me in the house before, you know, for sure. wanting intelligence or complaining about some intelligence I provided. I've had a special branch in my home at midnight, where I used to live in Aylesbury. And well, the police officer knocked at the door. I, I, my natural instinct was to invite them in because I work with law enforcement. I'm a good guy. I'm a white hat. So, you know, my first instinct was to come in and have a cup of tea. Yes. They were a bit surprised. They weren't normally offered cups of tea by people <laughs> they were about to arrest. Uh, and it, it did take, uh, I normally pick things up pretty quickly. I'm a fairly quick study, at least I think I am. Uh, but uh, it took me 30 seconds to grasp the fact that these, these idiots were serious. <laughs> I thought, hang on, come possibly be serious. And, and of course said, well, what, what are you arresting me for? 
I said, oh, well, you, you, you rang the Ministry of Defence yesterday. I said, well, no, the Ministry of Defence rang me. I said, oh, well, we're arresting you for a bomb hoax. Uh, they didn't tell me, in fact, initially. Um, they, they used the word malicious communication. I thought, well, what's this all about? I haven't, ma haven't made any malicious communications. Eventually, they said it was a bomb hoax. I just fell about laughing in the cell. I said, you can't be serious. Oh, my God. It was absolutely ridiculous. But, of course, what had happened was that a GA2 asset in the Cabinet Office... I know who the asset was, but I can't name him or her on television. But a GO2 asset, that's GO2, the German operation in London, goes back to the end of World War II. A GO2 asset in the Cabinet Office had ordered my arrest, knew about the nuclear warhead, and wanted me out of the way. Whilst I was in Ellsbury Police Station, the first of the warheads was actually removed from the UK. I, wasn't, I was released when the warhead was out of the way. So, in essence, you were giving them correct in oh yes yeah and how did you find out that the assets uh the, or the nuclear weapon was removed oh that was that was uh, very quickly afterwards i rang a cia contact and i got confirmation i'd had initial confirmation i was arrested on the friday and i'd had confirmation that the mod rang me on the thursday i was arrested on the friday afternoon about two o'clock uh, I've been working on my book. Right. <laughs> I thought, ah, oh, finally, I got that one out of the way. I've handed that one over. I can carry on, catch up with my work. And uh, I was happily working away on my book, uh, tapping away on my computer. The, th the previous night, I'd got the first confirmation from an old-time CIA friend uh, who flew U-2s over Cuba during the missile crisis, heavy-duty CIA. Okay. And in the book, he's uh, referred to as Bill. Uh, Bill was the first pilot for the first selected pilot for the Powers flight. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't want to get shot down, so he, he pulled out. Uh, he'd actually trained Frank Powers. In the CIA, Powers is always known as Frank. All right. Uh, and in fact, in the movie Bridge of Spies, you'll see my client. He was because that's how I first got to know him as a client. Uh, is there portrayed teaching the guys about the U two? Oh, is he? Uh, okay, he, was, he was an instructor. Right. He was an instructor to Frank Powers. And I rang, let's call him Bill, and I said, well, Bill, what's the story on this nuke? And he said, well, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 the effect of the conversation was a confirmation. Okay, there is a, I'm on the right lines, there is a nuke in London. Uh, over the weekend, I was in touch with, by very indirect means, with the National Security Agency. And I got, well, by the Sunday afternoon, it was clear that, that whilst I'd been in custody, the nuke had been smuggled out by submarine. And then, then of course, I briefed in Office of National Intelligence, the Office of Naval Intelligence, ONI. Well, the... how is it possible? I mean, you must. The, this information did it come to you? I mean, at this point, you were under. You were already. Were you in prison right away? Or no, I was. Re I was released. I was arrested about two fifteen on a Friday afternoon, and okay. released about one o'clock on the Saturday morning. The officers actually drove me home. By that stage, the nuke had just been released. So it's obviously word went down from GO2 in the Cabinet Office. Somebody in the Cabinet Office sanctioned my release once the nuke was out of the way. So the way I picture it is that uh, the Jerrys, as, as we affectionately refer to the Germans, our community partners, the Jerrys, are removing the nuke. It goes out on a Type 21 U-boat off an old U-boat rendezvous yes. point in the uh, Blackwater Estuary in es Essex. The U-boat moves out, takes the weapon with it. The U-boat is surfaced but hull down, so only, only the conning tower is showing above the water. Uh, the depth of water in the Blackwater estuary won't permit a Type 21 to go all the way up, uh, uh, submerged. The U-boat is transferred to the sub. The NSA actually picked that up. As the nuke was transferred from, we think it was an ambulance that it was being carried in, as it was transferred from what we think was the ambulance to the U-boat, uh, you get a spike in radiation. Okay. Uh, we suspect that the warhead had been, or the device had been encased in water, which is a very good means of absorbing radiation. It's a very good, water's a good radiation shield. Mm. Uh, but in order to get it through the loading hatch of a Type 21 U-boat, you had to remove the water bath. What you have is a water bath. You have, you have your weapon, it has a casing, then you have an outer casing, and between the weapon casing and the outer casing, you fill with water, that's quite a good absorber of radiation. Uh, but the water bath and the outer casing 
too too big to go through the loading hatch of a Type 21. So the casing comes off. That then gives you a radiation spike. Uh, and that's then picked up by an American satellite. So an American bird is not far away. Picks up a... Ra oh, radiation spike. Plutonium. What's that doing there? <laughs> Very interesting. The NSA yeah. weren't expecting plutonium in the Blackwater estuary. Well, uh, you know, that this is interesting. I mean, it's almost like, you know, a movie. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. look, this would be a great movie. Yeah. And, and so... The question is, if the American satellite picked it up, uh, there's also the conversations you were having, right? Yes. On your phone. Now, do you have special security, you know, where, where your phone is not, they can't tap your phone, they can't tap your house, et cetera, et cetera, because the surveillance is pretty pervasive, especially here in England. Yes. Uh, G GCHQ will automatically record any phone call that I make. That go, and any phone call, and, any digital and system. And myself as well. So, so. Exactly, yeah. So we, I'm used to that. But, of course, the good guys, being a white hat, the good guys also look after my phone lines. Sure. So if there's a tap on the phones that it shouldn't be there, then I will get a warning. Mm. So, yeah, my phones have always been looked after. Ah. Well, they have since, since I got involved in the world of spies and spooks. Right. And, well, we want to get back into all that as well. Your history, I, used to have my, I used to have my house checked, too. I, mean, I would have, uh, but it, it, it's, not, it, it's fairly expensive. It would cost about £1,000 a pound of time to get the house completely electronically swept. Right, except that a lot, uh, you know, I have whistleblowers that tell me about the, the state of surveillance now. Yes. Which is far beyond what Edwin, Edward Snowden is, is talking about. Yes, I mean, it, it's fairly extensive, yes. Yeah, so... Um, Basically, uh, we're talking, uh, you know, a, a certain kind of um, physics and, uh, you know, they're, they're using and there's also the AI and, and all of this. Oh, the, the, any, any phone call I make on a digital system is going to be recorded. Right. Uh, and it'll do it from within about five, ten seconds of the call because the, uh, it, whether I give my name or not, the voice print will pick up. But that works in my favour. It worked in my favour in my case because when the jury were being tampered with and when the... GO2 acid on the jury were telling the jury about the fitting me up over the indecent images. Of course, he referred to my name, and that immediately meant that uh, the calls were picked up. Right. Uh, because my name's a keyword. So the, 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 the Michael Shrimpton combined are keywords. Yes. So any, any conversation with my name in it is going to be recorded automatically. Right. And 99% of them may be totally boring conversations, and they may not even relate to this particular Michael Shrimpton. There is a more distinguished Michael Shrimpton who used to play cricket for New Zealand. <laughs> The far better cover drive than mine. But well, I'm sure they know the difference. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but at any rate, so the bottom line is that they were arresting you because even, even though there's proof that there was indeed a threat. Yes. Uh, and it was put in place, you're saying, by, you call it GA2? It's GO2, General GO2. Operations 2. It, the whole thing was done in bad faith. GO2 knew about the warhead. GO2 wanted me out of the way while the warhead was being exfiltrated from the UK. They didn't want a live nuclear warhead. You know, they, didn't, they didn't want, want to call with a live nuclear words, warhead. Who set the, new, the warhead? If it oh, wasn't the GO2? German DVD. Okay. So it's Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst, who I write about in, that's the, the main topic of, of uh, research right. in Spy Hunter. Uh, Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst is the German agency set up at the end of World War II. GO2 is their London operation. All right. So General Operations 2, it's based in a very discreet part of uh, MI6 headquarters at Vauxhall Cross. So, I mean, the, the interesting <coughs> thing here yeah. is, and that people need to realize, is that you're actually saying that MI5 is infiltrated. Yes. MI6 is infiltrated. Absolutely. GCHQ. Um, Absolutely. And basically also this goes for America as well. You're saying the highest levels of the British government are, yes. uh, are in on it. Yes. And um, and I would also say that you may have some good assets that backed you up with these phone calls telling you the status. Mm -hmm. But at the same time in America, you could have some people working against you because oh, yes. we, we believe there are. Uh, well, in essence, I mean, I you know who Jim Mars is. He talks about the Fourth yes. Reich and he's written about it. In the yes, America. I've read some. He, he writes very well. Yes. So, uh, and his books are very highly regarded. So, yes. you know, in essence, we have very very extensive infiltration in, in America. Uh, absolutely. If you think about it, well, uh, as I explained in Spy Hunter, in the 1950s, it's easier to talk on the media about dead German spies. Yes. <laughs> Live German spies gets into trouble with the, the libel courts. But uh, in the 1950s, the president reported to the DVD, that was Dwight Eisenhower, the head of the CIA. That's quite an interesting statement. Yes. Well, Eisenhower was a German spy. 
That's Eisenhower was, remember, was a German name. He was a, he was a German American. I hear you. Uh, Eisenhower reported to the Germans, and so did uh, Alan Walsh Dulles, director of the CIA. Or and the Dulles brothers. The Dulles brothers are clearly working is, is is very very important yes. because, of course, he ran the CIA for many many years. Indeed, he did. Um, and uh, there's been a recent book um, called "The Devil's uh, Chessboard," which. I, have you read it? it I haven't. No. Yeah, uh, David Talbot, I think, is the author. Um, yes, and I, it I know the name. Claims that Dulles was the mastermind behind the Kennedy assassination. Really right. It, he was one of the people, at least. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Now there are other people that claim that Johnson was the, you know, was sort of the henchman. But I well, believe that he would be a bit lower on the totem. Well, board. Johnson was in on it. Bill was in on the real CIA investigation. There were two investigations into Kennedy. Your asset, your yeah. friend. Who uh, my, is, uh, uh, my YouTube pilot friend, yeah. yeah. Uh, there were two investigations into Kennedy. Uh, there was the joke investigation, which was the Warren Commission, which right. was controlled by the DVD. They had blackmail material on Chief Justice Warren. Uh, Dulles actually sat on that commission. Yes. And so did a couple of other German assets or people close to the Germans. Gerald Ford, for example, was one. Uh, that commission was a complete joke. I mean, the, the, the idea that the Harvey yes. Oswald shot President Kennedy is just a farce. Uh, but th the real investigation was run by the CIA out of Dallas. And I think that's when the CIA set up their operation in Dallas. Right. It was set up specifically in response to the assassination. And Bill was involved in that, and so was Mr. T, another CIA well, it is, to and, it, and it is said that, I mean, you know, the CIA is involved, the FBI was involved. I mean, in other words, there's... A lot of, yes, but I, I think the, the important thing is to remember that the CIA and FBI involved in the false flags. It's a German operation. Kennedy is taken out for strategic reasons by German assets inside CIA and FBI. Right. At that stage, the, Germ the Germans had lost control of the CIA. Kennedy appoints uh, John McCone to be director of the CIA. Mm -hmm. Now, John McCone, interesting man, good American, patriot. McCone had investigated the assassination of JFK's brother, Joe Jr. Joe Jr. was murdered by the Germans in World War II, probably with the sanction of his father. Really? Almost certainly with the sanction of his father. My theory is that Joe had found out about his father working with the Germans. We know Joe Kennedy Sr., the ambassador, was working for the Germans. We right. used that to help, help us win the Battle of Britain. Kennedy Sr. is working for wow. the Germans. I, it looks as though Joe Kennedy Jr. found out about his father working for the Germans. Oh. But whether that's right or not, it's clear that the Germans arranged for him to be assassinated, and he was murdered flying a, uh, a, libera a Navy, U.S. Navy Liberator. Uh, I know the U.S. Navy didn't call it the Liberator, but the, um, he was flown flying, a, he was murdered whilst flying a consolidated uh, Liberator bomber, packed with high explosive. Uh, the theory was that he and the co-pilot were going to bail out. Uh, there was a chase plane. The, it looks as though the explosives were actually activated from the chase plane. As soon as they're armed, the Liberator blows up, and obviously the, the crew don't get out. So when you get this kind of information, yes. are you getting it from... Uh, it would, when it, one assumes this person, Bill, is for one... Bill is one of my sources, highly yes. placed. Yes. Um, and, and this is not his real name. No, now I've disguised him. And and he's still operational. Is this what still alive? Saying? Still alive. Yeah, we're still still alive. You don't retire. Yeah. You only retire from the intelligence. You only retire it, 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 to retire from the intelligence committee. You have to be one of two things: dead or gaga. Yeah. <laughs> when, when you're dead, then you finally retire. If you're gaga, your mind is completely gone and you become a liberal. Uh, then then yeah, that that's that's the end of it. But now uh, Bill is still. Uh, very much with us. Okay, very good. So, uh, and if he's we're... listening to this, I'm, I apologise. I didn't send him a Christmas card. This is normally I <laughs> normally I do. But, uh, okay, I'm afraid well... he dropped off the Christmas card list this year. So, so you were arrested. I'm going to go back to this mm. story, and and we can circle. I'm oh, happy to talk about it. being innocent. It, it, one, if people are guilty and they go to prison, they're often a bit reluctant to talk about it. But uh, I was innocent, so I'm more than happy to talk about well, it. Well, yeah. But you're also your own lawyer. Isn't that the case? Yes, I represented myself. Yeah. Yes. Now, you lost the case. Uh, y yes, I was sent to prison. <laughs> <laughs> and you, how long were you in prison? I was in prison six months. Six months? Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, and I know you, I heard you on a, another show say you're going to write a book about that experience. Yes, uh, I've already written about it on my column for Veterans Today. Uh, right. there, there was a slight, uh, one or two slight complications. One is that one of the, my cellmates was a gay serial, I'm gay, and one of my cellmates was a gay serial killer uh -huh. called Stephen Port. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. That's exactly. scary, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's quite nice serial. He's the nicest serial killer I've ever met. Oh, no. Uh, but he, his trial has only just concluded. He's now serving a whole life tariff for the murders of four young gay men, and oh, I think God. up to 15 other deaths are being investigated. But wasn't that a bit, um, you know, that's sort of like loading the deck? by putting you in a cell it, with somebody it, who's going to kill you? It was, it's a little bit unusual uh, that I'm gay and I end up in a cell with a gay serial killer and yeah. I'm not told that he's in prison. For, he was in prison initially for uh, perverting the course of justice in relation to concealing the body of one of his victims. Not, I didn't know not for murdering him. But no, no, no. No, he was in an open him. prison. He was in an open wing. He was let out early. He actually murdered. Okay. The, the fourth victim was murdered whilst he was on probation. Right. He well, was this, let out early. He was on a tag. The whole, the whole satanic so thing. So, exactly. I couldn't, write, I couldn't write about. It, it would be a bit silly writing about my experiences in prison without mentioning that I was a cellmate of Stephen Port. And his trial has only just finished. So, that was one reason I couldn't uh, write about it. Uh, and I decided that... Uh, but it is, I mean, you're even going on, I mean, this is a, a, a live, a recording. And yes. And we'll put this over there. Oh, yeah, I can talk about it freely now. Now yes. it's okay. Now it's okay. He's being convicted, you see. I didn't want to say anything about my prejudice trial. Yes. In fact, there was a possible, there was just an outside chance I might have been a witness for the prosecution oh. at his trial. Just an outside chance. Uh, I was interviewed by detectives from the Homicide Squad and happy to help, but I... I, I I told was them that before you went into prison? Oh, no, this was after I was released. Um, no. I, I mean, most intelligent policemen, there aren't that a many. A character witness, as it, it were. No, <laughs> the, the, the prosecution were interested to know whether he'd admitted to me whilst we were sharing a cell right. that uh, I think they spoke to all his cellmates. Uh, sometimes a prisoner will admit to a fellow prisoner sure, that they've committed a crime. Yes. Had he done so, then I would have assisted the prosecution, but uh, right. he didn't. Okay. But... To get back, so you're there for six months, they throw you in jail, and the reason, what was the official charge? The official charge was a bomb hoax. A bomb, bomb hoax. Bomb hoax, yes. And this nuclear weapon that somehow found its way to London? Yes. Where, this was for uh, during the ceremony of the Olympics? The intelligence, well, the original intelligence came from Moscow. Okay. The, the warhead is a Russian warhead. There are two. They are both... Uh, th are these suitcase nukes, or how big are they? they are, they're fairly small because they come off the... They're, they're warheads off a Russian cruise missile. They're off an SSN-19 granite cruise missile, and that is a fairly compact cruise missile. It's got a plutonium cord warhead. Well, can you show us with your hands how big... Oh, stop. No, it's, it's, right. it's not... It's, you, couldn't get it, you couldn't really get it into a suitcase, but you might, I suppose, with a bit of maneuvering you might just get it into an overhead locker on an aircraft okay. i mean they're not very large if you think about it the the cruise missiles were designed to be fired from ships and submarines mm -hmm. so they had you know, the loading sure. hatch if you think about it, the loading hatch is only 21 inches mm -hmm. it's five i think from memory it's a 533 mil loading hatch uh or okay. 533 mil exterior hatch on the kursk which was the submarine from which they were stolen in 2000 so they were stolen from a submarine. Yes. They made their way, what, was it to London the, from where? Well, piecing yeah. it together as best we can, uh, four Russian nuclear warheads are stolen from the Russian submarine Kursk, which is sabotaged, sinks in the Barents Sea. The Germans mount a, a very clever underwater operation, and the nukes are removed underwater. I now have an expert, John Large, who was assisting in the recovery of the Kursk for the Russian Navy, and confirms there were very special precautions taken in respect of obviously nuclear warheads. Right. Uh, the submarine was obviously carrying nuclear warheads and the Russian Navy weren't on top of the submarine all of the time. Uh, there was a guard ship most of the time, but it had to pull back to refuel and it had to, the escorts had to refuel and there was bad weather, it was the Barents Sea. Uh, there were windows of opportunity for the Germans to remove the warheads from the sub. It was sunk deliberately in shallow water to permit recovery of the warheads. That's 2000. Germany is now a nuclear armed power. You guys understand this. We understand this. You guys set up a crash program 
which I believe is sanctioned by President Bush, to, that's the nice Bush, the younger Bush, to uh, develop new methods of tracking nuclear warheads, new active sensors, right. able, active radiation sensors able to track nuclear warheads in and out of cities. It was perfectly clear the German intent from 2000 was to use these warheads against Western cities. Uh, that was the fear. Mm -hmm. And that, I only found out about that crash program after my, I found out just before my arrest from uh, an air marshal friend of mine who used to be Director General of Intelligence. Uh, he hinted that we had new sensors that were oh, able to detect warheads that, that were protected by shielding. Okay, but this warhead, uh, just to follow, you know, so that people can yes. don't get confused and can follow this trail, as I am trying to do. Um, basically, the warhead went then from Germany to the Olympics. Is yeah, yes, it goes. And and you, you knew about this because I know that at some point your your intel came from Ben Fulford among others. Exactly. Now I knew I knew about the four warheads on the Kursk, so I knew we had four missing SSN nineteen warheads with a nominal yield of five hundred kilotons. Okay. And I knew, I knew they were hydrogen bombs, so I knew they were, they were fusion weapons, very powerful, right. at least very powerful nominally. Uh, I didn't know until I consulted nuclear experts after my arrest. I didn't know that the warhead yield had deteriorated quite significantly. But that was the nominal yield, half a megaton. So we're talking serious, large nuclear warheads. Yes. I knew they'd gone missing. I knew the Kursk had been sabotaged. I knew the DVD had done the sabotage. I knew the DVD were in control of them. It's unclear where they were between 20, 2000 and 2012, but the thinking is that they were in Germany. Uh, the thinking is they were serviced in Germany, made operational. Two were smuggled into the UK. They probably came in on submarines. I initially thought the warhead that I was told about had come in on a Type 21. I now believe it was a Type 23 coastal submarine, and it may have come in actually up the Thames on a dark night. Is this on, would this be a uh, German submarine? Absolutely, or? yeah, these are, okay. uh, the DV, as I explained in Spyhunter, the Germans have a submarine fleet that was left over from World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, there are missing German U-boats, uh, and these are the Electro boats, the Type 21s, long range, air conditioned, specifically designed for transporting cargoes and people, not designed as combat submarines. Right. There was, a, there was a smaller class known as the Type 23, which were designed for ball-bearing traffic from Sweden, but ideally suited to smuggling nuclear warheads around. Uh, we know the subs came out of the old Valentine underground base on near Bremerhaven. Oh. And the Jerrys were very clever. They, they, with their submarine pens, with a covert submarine pen, you, you, you design it so that the, the submarine isn't going out on the surface. It's not like Holy Lock, where everybody can see the submarine going down the, that are going down to, out to the sea. Uh, the, the way the Jerrys do it is that the submarine leaves dock underwater, so you don't, you don't, you know, satellite doesn't catch the submarine going in and out of right. the, the base. It's not on the surface. Uh, we don't know quite when the warheads were smuggled in. Um, it seems to have been some months prior to. Ben Fulford being told about it by the Russians. Uh, the Russians track. So let's get uh, let's get a timeline here. Yeah. So about Ben Fulford might have been told. You said a few months before. So this is what year is this? Well, this is 2012. 2012. Yeah. They might have been moved in a few months before Ben was told. All right. Uh, the Russians track the warheads into England. That's okay. my belief. The Russians uh, tracked. The, the Russians are now tracking the German submarine fleet. We have a, a covert fleet of submarines. At one point, I know the Germans had four Type 24, Type 21s. The Russians sank one off the coast of Norway during the Madeleine McCann case. They were down to three. And we're going to talk about that. Let's not forget. Absolutely. Um, they were left with, as, as of 2012, so far as I knew, they had three operational Type 21s. And these have been refitted with air independent propulsion. Okay. So they're not using World War II engine technology anymore. They've got modern engines. The uh, Russians, I believe, tracked both submarines, two warheads, one, I think, in a Type 21, one, I think, in a Type 23. Both are tracked into the UK by the Russian Navy using Kilo-class, very quiet submarines, staying well back. And okay, I think the, no, the way I the Russians... I want to understand hmm. is not so much the technical part, but, but the human situation. So you've got the Russians notifying Ben Fulford for some reason. Correct. Fulford then notifying somebody else. 
Yes, and, and then that. And are the Russians doing this in order to get intel into a certain area of Britain? Yes. Sort of bypass instead of why not go directly to exactly. the Trump. There are several reasons for this. Uh, the first, and this is very difficult for those outside the intelligence community to understand, but because we have German penetration, this is a German operation, right? And our official agencies, five, six, GCHQ, and Defense Intelligence staff are all penetrated by Germany. Therefore, extraordinary. Ex exactly, the official channels of communication are compromised. Right. And if you get a message, let's say the Russians, the 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 person who passed the warning to Britain is now dead. A very courageous man, a very brilliant intelligence officer called Igor Sergin, Major General Igor Sergin, then head of the Russian GRU, military intelligence. Okay. Uh, he's aware that the Russians, have, he's obviously aware the Russian Navy tracked these warheads into Britain. Igor needs to get a message to London. How does he do it? He can't go through, for example, the MI6 head of station in Moscow. So he rings up the head of station in Moscow, invites him into a, a little little chat. Uh, but the intelligence then disappears into Vauxhall Cross and doesn't come out. So there's almost no point the Russians going through MI official channels. Those channels are compromised. The intelligence would never reach. That is really, I mean, scary. these are quite <laughs> substantial statements. You're yes. Making, and you make them all the time in the book. And yes. And I, I know that people think that you must be slightly mad to, to be <laughs> saying this all the time. And yet it, it makes perfect sense to me with the history that I know, uh, which is certainly above top secret. Um, yes. But I understand where it would be something outrageous to, you know, even a, 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 Br a British citizen. Of, of course. You know. It's difficult, difficult for the jury to understand, difficult for those who don't understand it. Now, you, you have a basic understanding with respect of intelligence. So, you know, what yes. I'm saying makes sense to you. But right. uh, to the man in the street, possibly not. So they but go those around, are the facts, and there's, uh, there's no point. I always used to tell my intelligence students, uh, intelligence is about telling truth to power. Uh, in a democracy, the people ought to have power. Certainly, they need to know what's going on. If you're telling intelligence the to the people, don't varnish it. Just get, get, tell, <laughs> tell it as it is. Now, it may be difficult for people to understand, but the, the, you, know, you try and simplify it, but you can only simplify it. So much. It's a well, complicated area. Maybe they'll learn and be educated. Well, that's right. Well, now, I did get accused. That should happen. It's a, it's a professional hazard to be accused of being mad. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, anybody who I say agree. I have the same problem. Yeah, exactly. If you say something that is non-mainstream, you know, people say, "Oh, you're mad." Uh, the, the Galileo was accused of being mad because he said the Earth went round the sun. Sure. Now, uh, the CPS tried that line in my trial, the Crown Prosecution Service. They were trying to paint me as mad. They, they were confused. The, the, the CPS were always confused. But the CPS, were, the CPS, they're usually confused. The CPS w were in, caught in two minds. They were trying to portray me as bad. At the same time, they were also trying to portray me as mad. And in a, in a trial, if you're the prosecution, you're effectively handing a defense to the defense. The, the, in my case, the prosecution pleaded insanity. <laughs> uh, I, my response to that was, well, I accept the prosecution are insane. Uh, you know, only the defense can plead insanity, Your Honor. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, might, it was extraordinary. Yeah, any I lawyer... Mean, I, I, actually, the case would make a great... Oh, the, case, the, the trial would be hilarious. Any lawyer listening to this is going to think, how can the prosecution plead insanity? Uh, why would the prosecution prosecute someone who they thought was mad? Because if you're mad, that's, that's supposed in, to let you insanity off, is a defense. <laughs> <laughs> extraordinary. Normally, it's the defense trying to say, I'm insane. Yes, you know? exactly. you know, normally, the defense are calling quack psychiatrists. You know, they, they put a standard defense tactic. They put a quack in the box to say, oh, the defendant was temporarily insane, Your Honor, or members of the jury. Uh, the prosecution tried that line. There was absolutely no evidence of insanity. There was no, they didn't right. have any medical reports. You're a working barrister. You're, <laughs> you're, 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 you know, everything you do is documented. I was a judge. I was a part-time judge for 12 years. Uh, the, the allegation of insanity was offensive, but also completely absurd. There was no evidence, evidential support for it at all. Right. What they were saying was, we don't accept what you say. It sounds mad. Therefore, you must be mad, which is a complete non sequitur. Right. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know one end of a nuclear weapon from another. They couldn't tell the difference in a fusion Why void or a fission void. Why wasn't this case even, you know, considered like a national security case of some kind? Well, because GO2 controlled because the Crown Prosecution. Because that would give you legitimacy that they didn't want you to yeah. have, I'm assuming. Well, GO2, the, the CPS reports to the Cabinet Office. And GO2, remember, control the Cabinet Office. Well, they, they, let's put it this way. GO2 have the pan Cabinet Office thoroughly penetrated. Okay, when we can can we ask the question about Theresa May? Yes. She announced it. 
Uh, not a German asset, no. Not a German asset. No. Interesting. No. Interesting. No, she, she's a white hat. She's a bit silly. Really? Yeah, she's she's okay. not the smartest. She's not the sharpest knife in the box. And Theresa and I have, ne and Theresa and I have never met. Um, she has made use of intelligence I've provided her, but it's never been direct. It's right. always right. gone through. Uh, I can give his name because he's now dead. Uh, and I don't think Harry ever met Theresa directly either. Uh, one of my contacts, sadly now dead, died at aged 101. Wow. Uh, they wouldn't let me. He died when I was in prison. I was very upset. I wanted to go to his funeral. They wouldn't um, let me. Harry, and I'm talking... last name since he is... Past Colonel time. Harry Beckoff. All right. Colonel Beckoff was Bletchley Park during World War II. Ah. He was responsible... And you have some statements about Bletchley oh, Park Oh yes. talk about. Oh, yes. Well, that being infiltrated... Harry, well, Harry, was the, Harry was security at Bletchley Park and discovered the Germans had infiltrated Bletchley. That's, that is so extraordinary. And he got the name of their agent. The, the top German agent at Bletchley Park was Roy Jenkins. They, they, was, they also had Cairn Cross. They had several, in fact. They had at least they had the head of MIC. Stuart Mingis uh, uh, was heavily involved in Bletchley Park. We were talking about Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park, Harry, Harry Beckhoff. We, we will come back to that. So no. we're still tracking this nuclear weapon and, yes. who, and how the intel... Had came in a kind of a circular it way. It came in a circular way. That's, how, that's often how intel is passed from one okay. country to another. You don't go direct. You loop it through two or three contacts, cutouts. Okay. In the intelligence world, they're called cutouts. Now, are we... I can't remember in your book uh, whether or not you name the person who was the go-between. Uh, Neil Jones. Yeah, yes, no, he's out in the open. Uh, as a result of my arrest, my f my the police got all my phone records. Oh, right. I protected Neil Jones for as long as I could. I, I wouldn't... It was obviously in my interest to say, look, it's a bomb hoax allegation. I'm not working on my own. The intelligence has passed to me. It would have given credibility to say it was passed to me by X. But I refused to name him up until the point where they went to interview him because they'd got his details they from my phone records. They had they, GCHQ tracked my incoming phone records. Well, uh, it so, would seem, yeah, but yeah. that should have let you off the hook altogether. So. Well, <laughs> yeah, again, any loyalist is going to say, hang on, this guy's charged with a bomb hoax. A hoax is something you make up. It's right. not something, it's not, you don't, a hoaxer does not pass on intelligence. He's got from somebody else. Now, I'm saying to the, to the Rosers, as we affectionately refer to the police in this country, I'm telling the Rosers an interview on the first you know, afternoon of my arrest, the first evening of my arrest, when they eventually get around to interviewing me, having left me stew in the cells for six hours while this warhead is smuggled out of Britain. And obviously they're having to put pressure on me. All they did was annoy me, particularly when they fed me some police station lasagna. If you're ever banged up in a police station in Britain, don't, don't ask for the lasagna. All it's right. terrible. Thank you for letting me. So I had the ahead. worst lasagna I'd ever had, and I am pretty annoyed by the time I get, they eventually get around to interviewing me. And I say, look, I'm passed in pa intelligence is passed to me. I pass it on it, with qualifications. I don't say this is the case. I'm saying I have been passed intelligence that it might be the case. Sure. It needs to be verified. Which, which, in essence, should let you off the hook. Well, right of, then and there. of course, no, there's you know, no offence. You're not saying, you know, hello, there's a bomb at such and such. Well, of course, they couldn't, they could, the problem I had, I did, they wouldn't show me the note. The briefing, oh, when... Right. all uh, the notes disappeared. All the notes disappeared. Barry Burton, of the Ministry of Defence, who's the private secretary to the Secretary of State for Defence, who's then Philip Hammond, Burton rings me, takes an accurate note. The Cabinet Office, he faxes the note to the Cabinet Office, a cabinet office Which request. is a phone call recorded as well. It, that's GCHQ. how the NSA, exactly, NSA and GCHQ both get the, the sure. note, which now is in the hands of MI5. Which is infiltrated. Which is infiltrated, but uh, we have been able to deal with some of the worst of the infiltration at MI5. All right. MI5 are now helping me. Oh. That's that on works. the record. It's on the record. They've provided, it, it's out there in the open. I put in a Freedom of Information Act request and stuff came back. Okay, now Neil Jones, we need, we need, to, what, who is he? What does he He's do? He's a computer scientist. He and I first met at a, U, uh, not a UKIP, but a Eurosceptic event in Oxshot in Surrey. And this is all out in the open. This, he, yes. he, he was a witness at my trial. So, right. you know, he's, yes. it's out in the open. Neil and I collaborated on intelligence matters for 10 years. Mm. Uh, very successful. Yes. Now, Neil was in touch. So in other words, he has given you intel that's proven to be correct. Exactly. He was in touch with Ben Fulford. Apart from one of his All sources right. is Ben Fulford. He's in touch with Ben Fulford. But he's also in touch with a number of other computer scientists. 
Now, I'm not accusing Neil of doing anything unlawful, because I, I don't think it's unlawful anyway. There is, in addition to the internet, which we all know about, a yeah. thing called the dark web. Yes. Okay. Now, Neil is not... I'm not saying Neil was accessing the dark web. I don't think he was, in fact. Uh -huh. But it's perfectly clear to me that he was in touch with a, a, a slightly shadowy group of computer scientists who were patrolling the dark web. Okay. Yeah, the dark web is a very valuable source of intelligence. There's a whole bunch of stuff on the dark web. It's also, there's also a whole bunch of pornography and all sorts of stuff on the dark web. Sure. But the, it, the dark web is a valuable source of intelligence. It's mm -hmm. used by Al-Qaeda. Right. So Neil and I collaborated, and one of the things we collaborated on was trying to prevent the 22-7 terrorist attacks in London. And we get word that there is an intercept of a, a, a three-letter three Al-Qaeda city code and we get word that a mass transit attack is going down on Thursday, July 21st. And you, but you gave that warning as well. I gave that warning to Chicago PD and to uh, the Met, and it was ignored, and, and the attack went ahead. It was ignored, and the but you were correct. I'm absolutely right. And it yeah. was recorded. So you wasn't that prior to this arrest? Absolutely, it was 2005. Ex oh, there you go. So, so well, you the, actually the whole thing's are done. on the record <laughs> yes, as um, having given good, given good intelligence yes, and exactly. good warnings in the past. Uh, indeed, and when, I, when Chicago PD and rang me... Right. Oh, exactly. Crazy. Chicago PD rang me. The, the, reason I rang, the, the reason I passed an alert to the Americans and Chicago PD rang me on the advice of a, a very senior American general mm -hmm. uh, who had previously come out of Delta Force, and if you're a general in Delta Force, you're fairly high up, because, you know, uh, a Delta Force general had advised Chicago PD to get a hold of me. Now, the reason Chicago were interested was because the two, uh, we only had a fragment, we had two out of two out of the three letter city codes, and two of the letters were common to London and Chicago. Oh, so we have, we have a fragment of a code. This is often, intelligence is often like this. An intercept, people think, oh, you know, intercepts, you, you get the whole thing. No, it's a bit like, it, it, the best depiction of it in a movie is that very good film, Midway, starring Charlton Heston. And the, the brilliant intelligence officer for Admiral Nimitz, who the Germans then punished by putting him in charge of a dry dock in San Francisco, wins the Battle of Midway for you guys by accurately predicting the Japanese attack plan. But he's working on fragments, and there's that marvellous scene where, is it Henry Fonda playing Admiral Nimitz? Uh, has a go at uh, Joe. I have to revisit that movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, trust me, the intelligence officer of the US Pacific Fleet was absolutely brilliant. And there's that marvellous scene where uh, Charlton, uh, I think it's Henry Fonda, I haven't seen the film for some time, but sure. uh, Henry Fonda is having a go, Joe, how much are you reading of the Japanese code? Oh, 10%. Uh, I give the, 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 the I, I comment on that in Spy Hunter because in the movie he's predicted uh, he's portrayed as a heterosexual Texan. Uh, most Texans are heterosexual. Um, he's, he's portrayed as a heterosexual Texan with a broad Texan accent. In fact, he was a bisexual uh, guy from Connecticut, I think, uh, which <laughs> wasn't right. quite so, you know, wasn't I mean, in Hollywood in the seventies. Yeah, the, Hollywood in the seventies couldn't quite sell a, a, a gay or a bi guy from Connecticut. Right. A heterosexual from Texas was a much easier sell. Um, and it was Joe Rochefort, and, and and Nimitz is telling off Commander Rochefort in the film. So, what do you mean you're only reading ten percent? It's often that way. You're not getting all of what the bad guys are saying. Sure. You know, you, you're getting a fragment. We had a two. We had two out of three letters. We had a fragment. We matched the fragment to Chicago and London. So that indicated that an attack is going down, mass transit, Chicago or London. So you warn both. Right. I warned Chicago. Oh, Chicago PD ring me. I say, look, guys, this is a fragment. It may not be. It may be London. It may be Chicago. We don't know. But, you know, this looks serious. And it so happened that Al-Qaeda were planning an attack on Chicago and on the Elva system, the elevated railroad in Chicago, okay. which is you know, a very, very good system. Oh, but we do have to clarify who Al-Qaeda Al really is. Well, Al-Qaeda is a DVD spin-off. I mean, they're controlled by the Germans. So okay. It's a German-controlled so terrorist organization. Like, hello. <laughs> hello. It's just, you know, very interesting, all of this. Well, of that's those. how we whacked bin Laden. I mean, you know, that's how we got bin Laden whacked. Well... By actually, his own side, the, okay, the, the, there's a deal done. But the, the, the in Chicago. He died though many years before the actual. Oh, he, he, he was died. he was whacked in 2009. Yeah. Uh -huh. But the, uh, uh, we had the two letter fragment. Uh, Chicago, the Al Qaeda had a reconnaissance cell in Chicago, and they were looking at vulnerable points of the L system. 
So Chicago were very pleased. They said, okay, great, we've got Al-Qaeda on the ground, and they, they prevented the attack. Mm -hmm. They were professional. Chicago PD were very good. Their, oh. their commissioner of police was very good. And I commend Chicago PD, because they've, they've never dealt with me before. I, I don't normally deal with Chicago. Right. Okay. And they were intelligent, they were professional, they were good. They didn't leap on the intelligence and, and immediately shut down the L. I wasn't saying that. I said, look, let's check it out, which is what I was saying to MOD about the nuclear war. It's, let's check the intelligence. But then you also, yeah, you, but you also checked told London yeah, at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Who was, your, who was the contact? In Special London? Branch. Special Branch came to my house at midnight. Okay. Uh, a guy from Special Branch came up in a steaming foul mood. I think he had plans to arrest me. Uh, oh, no. he, well, uh, uh, What is it with Brits? I mean, oh. Don't they want intelligence? Well, the Rosses in Britain are thick. This is the trouble. Our Rosses are not very bright. Uh, this Special Branch guy is not very bright. Right. Um, there was a Met, senior Met official, a senior Metropolitan Police officer was visiting Chicago. He hears Michael Shrimpton's name mentioned in the Chicago control room, uh, probably from the Commissioner of Police. He doesn't know me from Adam, wants to know what the hell is going on. Right. Special Branch charge up the, M, charge up the A41, hammer on my door at midnight and the guy calmed down as soon as he was in the house a because i'm it's midnight i'm working a terrorist attack and i was trying to get to the bottom of what's going on here so uh, it's midnight i'm still working i'm fully dressed oh. midnight come in right. cup of tea your special branch have a cup of tea uh the desk is covered with maps papers you know you name it and, and right. immediately he realized oh hang on Whatever, whatever you've been told about me, he, he, he realised I've just been fed a whole crock about this guy. This is, you know, this is obviously a serious individual. Right. Uh, my old house uh, I had prints on the walls signed by VCs and marshals of the Royal Air Force, and you know, there was a print there signed by Bomber Harris. Yes. The two prints signed by Bomber Harris, and he's looking at these and. And he's looking at a picture of an aeroplane and saying, well, "What's that aeroplane? That's the one I used to fly. You know, the one I did my first solo." It, it, and there were, I probably had a thousand books about intelligence and journals, and uh, the whole of my lounge was a library. It was, you I know, would have the, loved to see that. Oh, there, there, there would have been intelligence journal, you know, journals of intelligence, just just literally stacked. Are, it didn't have the shelf still space. Have all of this? Or? No, when I lost the house, I, I was turned over financially, lost the house, and uh, I had to break up my library, which is really upsetting. Because I'd oh, spent no. years putting together That's this library. I had over a thousand volumes in the house, oh, uh, mostly military and intelligence. And right. journals, you know, I, I'd be, uh, you know, I was an intelligence specialist. And, and I, you know, I would have stacks of journals just piled high. And he could see all these and, oh, okay, this guy's not. Right. So, you he's know, not he's, your average. He's not your average. Your barrister? I mean. Not your average barrister, <laughs> no, exactly. And he calmed down. And I think he did say to the Met, uh, look, this intelligence should be taken seriously. Unfortunately, he wasn't listened to. Right. The Met ignored it, and the attack went ahead. Well, that was the plan, wasn't it? That was the plan, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, uh, fortunately for so the... So we're talking a false flag, again, t carried out by what you would consider to be DVD assets. Oh, the, 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 DVD, GO2, but the, the DVD. GO2. GO2 is part of the DVD, so right. GO2, yes. Okay. Absolutely. The British... E exactly. Uh, coming, back to, coming back to Ben Fulford uh, right. and your earlier question... Uh, which I haven't ignored. Thank you. Uh, how does intelligence reach me? Well, Igor Sergin in, Te in Moscow, use the American pronunciation, Igor Sergin in what we say Moscow, you say Moscow. Uh, we, we say tomato, you say tomato. <laughs> in okay. Moscow, Igor's got this intelligence. He knows, uh-oh, the Brits are in trouble. Two of our warheads have ended up in London. We don't want... Uh, he, he was generally concerned about loss of life and he was friendly towards Britain. He didn't want a nuclear warhead being detonated in London to start with. Okay, so he's a good guy. He's Excellent. a white hat. All right. So that's good. But also, he, he was a intel professional intelligence officer and he realised we particularly don't want a Russian nuclear warhead detonating in London because the plutonium will be Russian. Plutonium very, gives off a signature. Very bad PR. So the next thing we have is Trident, you know, Trident missiles landing on Moscow. Right. Uh, so Igor got the message to Ben, but the Russians knew that I was working with Neil Jones and they knew that Neil was in touch with Ben. All right. So Igor, I think, correctly calculated, if I spin this via Tokyo, A, my fingerprints are not on the intelligence. Okay. You know, this is coming from Tokyo, not Moscow. All right. B, uh, it will reach London because okay. it will reach Michael if I go through Ben. And see, it protects the intermediaries in the middle. Uh, you know, there's a chain of cutouts. So we have a chain of cutouts. 
Uh, ben has now gone public. He had a source called Romanov. Romanov's a code name. Okay. Romanov is close to GRU. So Igor tells Romanov, there's probably another agent between Igor and Romanov. Well, there would have been. Igor's right. the director. So one of Igor's boys briefs in Romanov. We believe that briefing was actually carried out in Belgrade. So I think the intelligence goes, Moscow looped to Tokyo through Belgrade okay, and looped to Michael via Neil Jones and Kent. Okay, but one question. Did Fulford testify at your trial or was he asked to? He was asked to. He was going to testify. Um, uh, I had arranged or I was arranging for a video link. Now, normally in an English trial, the overseas witness gives evidence via video link. You don't have to pay for the airfare. Okay. The judge, um, Judge McCreth, refused my application on the morning of the trial. And I'd been pushing for a video link for, you know, I'd You're raised kidding. it. I'd raised it months in advance. I said, look, he, the witness is in Tokyo. Well, we need to sign a video he, link. He would seem to be a primary. Make the application on the morning of the trial. Well, okay, it's a straightforward application. There shouldn't be any problem with this. So I make the application first morning of the trial. Uh, may it please you, my lord, I have witnessed Ben Fulford. He's critical to the defence. He is the one who channels the intelligence to Mr. Jones, who is a prosecution witness. Neil Jones is dropped by the prosecution on the morning of the trial to prevent me from properly taking a witness statement from him, causing me tactical difficulties, a really nasty, dirty trick, which I'm still annoyed about. The prosecution called Neil Jones as a witness with no intention ever of calling him. He's only on the prosecution witness list to stop me talking to him. Oh. Yeah, it's a n nasty little trick. Dirty little have trick. Have you since talked to him? Oh, yeah. I mean, but, but the trouble is I, ha I had to try and get a statement taken from him in the middle of the trial. Very difficult. You know, my hands are full. I'm representing myself. So, so they didn't admit Ben Fulford's testimony? No, absolutely not. The judge said, nope, you can't have call my video. Why? Well, he didn't give me reasons. That's extraordinary. Well, I, I gave a couple of, with respect to the judge, he gave a couple of you know, but pretty, but still, pretty I mean, weak reasons. I mean, with respect. the defense can't have their primary witness. He's a star there. witness, yes. It's so, not like he was inaccessible. That's right. Now, at that stage, money was starting to be a problem because I, I had various restrictions placed on my practice. Uh, I, you know, a, a, a huge amount of time was taken up with this nonsense. But also, I was, my, I'd been prevented from building up my practice, so my income So this was, all happened, did it happen in 2012? This was, the trial was 2014. The, the rest was April 2012. It took no, till November 2014 for the trial to go ahead. Okay. They had to time the trial for when they had a GO2 asset on the jury. The trial was put back eight months to allow the jury to be tampered with. I see. They weren't happy with the first jury. Mm. Uh, one of the jurors came up to me after the case was adjourned and, and knew of me and thanked me for my work and... No, right. it was obviously a problem with the first jury. So the, the, the trial is postponed to the prosecution's amazement for eight months. It was postponed to a time when they had one of their guys on the jury panel. Okay. Uh, the Fulford... Okay, go ahead. Uh, I, have, I don't have a lot of cash at that stage. I don't have enough money to put up a plane ticket for Ben Fulford, but uh, I have a number of contacts. One of them in New York immediately arranged for a, a bank of half a million air miles to be placed at my disposal. Now, viewers may say, well, what, half a million air miles, that won't take you very far. Oh, yes, it will. That was just perfect. You know, I was flying witnesses in from all over the world. All my applications for video link were refused. I had to fly in a witness from Jerusalem. Uh, right. the, the distinguished Israeli historian, Dr. Robert Kaplan, who wrote, writes the, the, the foreword for The Spy Hunter. Okay. Uh, Robert, uh, I had to fly Robert in from Jerusalem. I had to fly Ben from Tokyo, and I wanted to fly them first class if I could. Uh, so I, I organized first class ticket on Virgin, upper class from out of Narita into Heathrow. That's organized on Friday. This is actually caught by camera because a, a documentary maker wants to make a documentary about this trial. He's at my home on a Sunday interviewing me. Oh. I'm seeing, he, he, you'll see me on camera, when that documentary is eventually aired, if it is ever aired, you'll see me on camera uh, checking my email Sunday morning. I get confirmation from Ben. I'm booked on the flight. I'm out of Narita tomorrow. Uh, I'm arriving Tuesday morning, London, and I need a hotel. And I'm thinking, great. So I'm sorting out a hotel for Ben. Outstanding. And I'm, the viewers will be able to see when this footage is eventually released. I'm delighted. This is my key man. I've been arranging at, at, at very short notice with no money. I'd have to arrange to fly Ben from Tokyo Absolutely. to London. So you know, I pull the stops out. I'm thinking, hooray, we got him on the flight. I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't sure there were going to be seats available. So I've got him on upper class on air miles, short notice. And I'm thinking, great, thank you, Virgin. And half an hour later, 
I read the email. The, the email had been sent Saturday night. I'm checking it Sunday morning. Half an hour later, email comes in from Ben. Sorry, the Japanese government have arranged a, a, a tax audit over the weekend after the flight was confirmed. I can't leave Japan. Uh -huh. So the Japanese government Perfect. pulled my key witness. Obviously, Are they working with the Germans? No, they're working, well, they're working with the Germans and, and probably got a request from London. Probably came from the foreign ministry in London, foreign office in London. But anyway, whether it came from the Foreign Office in London, the British Ambassador in Tokyo, MI6 said a station, probably MI6 said a station in Tokyo, uh, somebody yanks my key witness. Now, he is now on the record. He's given a sworn statement, and that is with the Criminal Cases Review Commission, which puts my whole bomb hoax conviction into play. Well, and, you know, for play. the record, uh, Ben Fulford is, I've interviewed him. Yes. Uh, actually, a couple times. I didn't and, know that. Yes. Yes. Yes, and in fact, I'm one of the few people who has flown to Japan, interviewed him in person. Oh, well, no. Yeah, and I might be the only one, for all I know. <laughs> he but he's a former Forbes journalist. I know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he has quite, a, a, quite a, a substantial background, and he is respected in, yes. in, in those terms. I, um, didn't know, I didn't know that you had uh, met Ben and interviewed him. Yes. Uh, he's good people. Yes. Now he is good fed. Look, he the, is, however, uh, to some degree, um, you know, under the hand of the triad, or you know. Well, it's the White Dragon Society, uh, and the Black Hats are feeding Ben. Somebody is feeding Ben some false intel. Yes. It's a standard method of discrediting people. Right. Somebody is feeding Ben false intel about trials and what have you know. Clinton going on. Well, I mean, he clearly Canada. says on my interview because this was fairly recent after yeah. he kind of went public about being threatened by the uh, the Oriental Secret Societies and yes. in essence kind of forced to come to heal in, with regard to their agenda. Uh, so, you know, um, he's, he's in other words, on, yeah. there is, you know. Yeah. He's been put under pressure and also somebody, he, there is somebody close to him who is feeding him rubbish. Uh, like, for example, Hillary Clinton is going to be put on trial in January. She's not going to be put yes. on trial in January. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hillary's under close arrest. He okay. said that over the weekend. He, Hillary Clinton is not under house arrest. She's not under house arrest, nor is Bush senior. No, I mean, I, I, I know that he's been getting false in, intel. Yeah. He also gets some good pieces uh, here every now and then. Well, exactly. And this is, he, he's not, he warned about Fukushima. Right. So you can't, you know, this is, this is the only man on the That's planet. That's interesting, though, yeah. because since Fukushima has yeah. happened, he's in complete denial as to the fallout. Yeah, the radiation. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to criticise Ben on air. He's, it's not his fault he's been fed false information. It goes yeah. to his credit. Yeah. Uh, people try and feed me false stuff. Um, and, and me. I'm, all, mean, I'm always on the lookout for, I'm always on the lookout for what, what Duff Jen. Right. You know, I, I'm always suspicious of well, Duff Well, it's the liability Jen. of being in this business. It's a standard tactic. It, it's an absolute standard tactic. Um, so, so Ben, uh, ben can't, doesn't give evidence to my trial. I sink with that trace. The jury are nobbled uh, and I'm sent down for 12 months. Okay, but, but you got out in six? I, well, yes, it's standard in England. You, you get uh, six months remission. Oh, really? That's automatic, yeah. Oh. Yeah. You so, serve half your time. So from what, what time uh, was this that you were actually in jail? Uh, I've sent, uh, the sentence was put back the CPS was still trying to portray me as mad. I, I retaliated by joining Mensa. I said, well, if you're going to accuse me of being mentally ill, I'm going to take an IQ test and join Mensa. Right. Uh, the psych they actually got the judge to appoint a psychiatrist. There was a huge delay. They were obviously trying to find a tame quack somewhere. They couldn't find one. Ah. They ended up with an honest psychiatrist. There are, there are honest psychiatrists. And her starting point for my IQ in interview was 185. Mm -hmm. I said, well, yeah, that's, that's the CIA are about... Two points above you, I think. So, yeah, yeah well done. That, that's that. My it, when you work with intelligence agents, they do psychological profiles. They don't want to. Are you are you gay? Are you vulnerable to blackmail? Do you have any particular perversions that they can exploit, or the bad guys can exploit? Uh, your alcohol consumption? Are you on drugs? I mean, I, yes. I had Mossad had a doctor sat next to me on a flight to Boston once, measuring my alcohol consumption, really? and I realised what he was doing. I, oh, he was obviously reporting to Mossad. He's a nice guy. Uh, he'd been looking after Ariel Sharon, the, the Israeli Prime Minister. I knew he'd snuffed it on the operating table. He was a bit shocked I knew that Ariel had snuffed it. We were having a conversation about Ariel Sharon. I'm thinking, OK, this guy's clearly Mossad. <laughs> he's, clearly, <laughs> he's clearly one of Mossad's tame quacks. Yeah. And uh, I, shot, there was a, I was on American Airlines, and there was a lovely... American Airlines had the most lovely um, 
uh, flight attendants. No, uh, okay. Not, uh, I don't mean uh, young and pretty, they're all good looking, but uh, they have very experienced flight attendants mm -hmm. who've been around and are really nice people. Uh, there's a lovely flight attendant um, uh, came around with a lunch order and uh, uh, I'm in business class and I, there was no first class on the plane, so I'm in business. At the front of the plane, the Mossad's sitting next to me, we're in seats 2A and B or whatever, and she says, what, will you have anything to drink? I said, oh, yeah, this, this guy's got to check my alcohol consumption, so I'm going to boost it. <laughs> I said, I'm going to have a brandy. I have a brandy and a port. Normally, I only have a port. But I'm going to have a brandy and a port, and I'll have a, a bit of extra glass of wine. Then I turned to him and said, make a note of this. Yeah, <laughs> he realised he'd been spotted. Right. So you have, you, know, you, get, you get assessed, you get profiled. So my IQ is something intelligence agents want to know about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the CIA's estimate is apparently 187. Uh, the doctor thought it was 185. You know, it's, 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 it's up there somewhere. It's good. It, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's fairly good. high. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So at this point, though, let's, let's kind of go down the road a little bit further. Uh, you've, got, you've got the DVD. You cover the DVD and you cover the fact that they're basically all through the history. Um, yes. Starting with what, what year? Well, the DVD takes over from the Abwehr and the Gestapo. Everybody's heard about the Gestapo. Not everybody's heard about the Abwehr, but most people have. It's fairly well yes. known. The director of the Abwehr is Admiral Wilhelm Canaris. Canaris takes over, sets up the DVD. The DVD is when German intelligence realise we're losing this war, they are planning for the post-war. So what they do is they merge the Gestapo and the Abwehr and military intelligence into a new, and the SS into a new intelligence agency, not the, right. not the uniformed SS, but the Sicherheitsdienst, the SD, which was largely controlled by the Abwehr. Many of the SD did not report to, to Heinrich Himmler. All the sabotage specialists like um, uh, Standart and Führer, Otto Skorzeny, they go into the new agency. So Canaris is there. He's thinking, we're losing this war. We've got an idiot in charge. Uh, we're going to lose. You know, we're, we're in a two-front war. Uh, he realised as early as 41 that Germany couldn't win. And he is planning for the post-war. He wants to carry on controlling London, Moscow, and Stalin reports to Canaris. He's got Eisenhower. He's got the Dulles brothers. He's got uh, Macmillan and Roy Jenkins and Ted Heath and a whole bunch of potential future prime ministers in Britain. Uh, he's got the director. He's got the governor of the Bank of England. He's got the Federal Reserve chairman. He's got a whole bunch of people. He does not want to lose control in Moscow, London and Washington. Uh, he doesn't want to break up his intelligence networks, so they have to go into a new agency. And he bases it down in the American sector. Now, he cut some sort of deal. Uh, it looks as though he agreed to supply some enriched uranium to you guys as part of a, a deal whereby the DVD could operate out of the American sector. Because the DVD is headquartered in the American sector, there is of a deal. Germany. Yeah, there's a deal. The U-boat turns up with some neutralium, and it but also, um, well, I know at least after the war that Dulles was very active in Germany. Oh, very. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was active in Germany before the war. He was on the board of he was on the board of an IG Farben subsidiary right. in New York. <laughs> well, <that laughs> he was too, very. He yes. regularly visited Switzerland but, and but Germany. Basically, kind of continuing business as usual with. Oh, absolutely. A lot of, you know, yeah. German. Aspects well, Dulles knew Canaris personally. I mean, the Dulles, both Dulles brothers knew Canaris. They were right. both working for him. Uh, they were, they, in World War II, they are trying to carve up a separate peace deal. Uh, the, the decision to form the DVD was taken after the collapse of the peace deal. Uh, Canaris probably starts planning in 41. Uh, he tries to get a separate peace deal underway using uh, John Foster Dulles as an intermediary. Right. That fails, and then he realises, no peace, we're going to lose, definitely we're going to lose, and we need to start the post-war planning. Or, you know, the, the actual setting up of the agency starts in the what fall of 1943. What about the Nuremberg trials? What was oh, they were the... a joke. Oh, okay. A big farce. Explain to me why. Well, they were farce in several ways. Uh, firstly, people put on trial who should never been put on trial. Uh, because? Oh, they were just officers. They were, they, were, they were doing their job. I mean, they were military officers. They were under, not war. under orders. They were under orders. And this, this Nuremberg defense, this idea that, a military officer can't plead orders as a defence. It's just nonsense. Okay. It really is. Uh, and what, uh, officers are there to obey orders. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't... If, if a 
junior officer, even a senior officer, is obeying orders that are coming down the chain of command. You go up the chain of command and you prosecute the guy at the top. Okay, you don't so prosecute guys halfway up. Okay, where should they have gone, though? I mean, where didn't they go that they should have gone? Well, uh, I have to say the military defendants, most of them should never be put on trial at all. They're not guilty of war crimes. So are, are you putting it at the feet of only Hitler or who else? I mean, well, he, no, they are, the guy's not working alone, right? They're correct. The, the, the decision to start World War II was taken by Adolf Hitler. Canaris was opposed to starting war. He mm -hmm. didn't, he, he could see there was a risk that, you know, he, he, he understood that it was going to be but very there risky. Was, I, I read something somewhere, I can't remember where it was, uh, which sounded convincing to me anyway, um, and it, it said that Churchill, the Bushes, and a few other um, individuals, basically, and I guess I.G. Farben, uh, decided that to use Hitler no. to, to start a war and that, that he got out of hand. No. And had to be reined back in. Uh, Canaris controlled Hitler. Canaris installed Hitler. Remember, Mein Kampf is written by Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess reports to Canaris. So Mein Kampf is written by a German intelligence officer. Right. He reports to the head of German intelligence. Canaris takes over German intelligence late 20s, early 30s. Mm -hmm. Ludendorff is the predecessor. There may be one guy that we don't know about between Ludendorff and Canaris because it's all black at that stage. Right. So you've got... Adolf Hitler is installed by German intelligence. Okay. Now, Hitler, okay. remember, was an intelligence officer. He's an intelligence officer yes. installed by German intelligence. All right. They control him up till 38. In 38, Hitler seizes the Austrian gold reserves. He gets 11 metric tons of gold out of Vienna. All of a sudden, the Nazis have their own cash. They've and got gold, that, they've got you cash. Also, you also detail uh, that gold or gold shipments mm. coming in uh, to Germany from Japan. Exactly, Japan and China. And, and why did they send their gold to Germany? That's because they had cut a deal, and that involved Germany doing the military aggression, Chinese people in China bankrolling it, uh, the Chinese are setting up trading programs, the Germans, are, the Germans are leveraging gold, the Chinese supply the gold, the Germans do the leveraging. All right, now this, this gets into uh, the, we're getting to, uh, you know the trading programs is a really key area. Yeah. And, and you mentioned the, what, what are called the, I guess, MTM. They're the yeah, medium term no trading, exactly. But there, I don't know I, if there are other trading programs because I've got another witness that talks about the trading programs as yeah. being very instrumental at this time, uh, that the Bushes run it and that it's also run through the, if I understand it correctly, the Federal Reserve. Correct. And it, um, now you're saying it originates in Germany. Oh, yeah. The Federal Reserve is under German control. Remember, the Germans set up the Federal Reserve. I heard Reserve. it was under the Vatican. No. But there are Vatican links because the Vatican, remember, Vatican uh, religion is only one of the core. Needless to say. <laughs> one of the, religion is one of the core <laughs> yeah. functions of the Actually, Vatican. It's a hobby. No. Okay, yeah, yes. Exactly. The religion is, but the Jesuits, the religion is just a cover story. Right. Um, there are some genuine religious people in the Vatican. Uh, it may Imagine. sound odd to say it, but there are some genuine, yeah. there's some very nice people in the Vatican. And yeah. there are, Pope well, Benedict. Fair enough. Enough. You know, I'm, I, I mean, there are in almost every one of these lines. Of yeah, work, I mean, right? a, a lot of churches contain religious people. Yes. It may sound strange to say it, but uh, you know, a lot of <laughs> no, churches no, contain they, religious they, people. And people that firmly believe some of these things. Uh, Benedict's a good man, Pope Benedict. I've never met him personally, but we've had dealings mm -hmm. through intermediaries. So he's a good man. Uh, the Vatican Bank is heavily involved in trading programs. The Jesuits are heavily involved in German intelligence. That goes way, way back. Way right. back. Yes. Uh, so there, in, there is a link up there. Exactly. Uh, the Chinese supply the gold, but the Germans do the trading programs. So if you want to make money out of gold, you run a line of credit against the gold, and then you trade that on the MTN markets. That's how you use gold. Remember, if you've, just, if you've got, let's say you're a Chinese ancient family and you've got 10,000 metric tons of gold. Right. Practice is probably 40,000 metric tons of gold. You've got to be wary about Chinese gold figures because the gold is often very low purity. But let's say you've got 10,000 tons of refined 9999, you know, you can, uh, uh, you've got 10,000 tons of proof gold. Uh, you want to make money out of it. What do you do? You, you sell it. Well, the trouble with selling it is you're then reducing your gold stockpile. If you want to keep the gold and make the gold work for you, then you've got to go and talk to the Germans because then the Germans control offshore high-yield trading. 
German controlled banks will set up a line of credit against your gold. And you consider JP Morgan a German controlled bank? Oh, jo- absolutely. Yeah, well, JP, John Pierpont Morgan was a German asset, yes. All right. Yeah, he's yeah. a German American. Absolutely. And remember, JP Morgan owned the Titanic and arranged for the Titanic to sink. And you, yes, and we, sh- we should also touch on that, that yes. as well. I haven't forgotten, incidentally, viewers may say, oh, we steered away from the subject of Theresa May. I haven't. Um, coming back to my answer about Harry Beckoff. Harry Beckoff is an intelligence officer. He's one of my contacts. Uh, Harry briefs in another chairman, ex-chairman of the Conservative Party. That chairman briefs in Theresa May. And so to, when I say I've been providing intelligence to Theresa May, it's not direct. It's been looped through Harry, okay. one of Theresa May's predecessors as chairman of the Conservative Party, and Theresa May. Remember, she was chairman of the party at one point. So she gets some very powerful, high-grade intelligence, some of which is sourced to me. And she uses that, leverages that with David Cameron, and that's how she became Home Secretary. Remember, it's a big promotion for her. She wasn't what do you mean? Her. You mean that... Are you saying that your your piece of intelligence contributed to her oh, yes. career move? Oh yes. Which and that piece of intelligence was what exactly? <laughs> that I could possibly. Oh, you can tell. <laughs> there are certain things. Uh, it, 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 it concerns people who are alive. All right. Um, who it, 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 if the truth came out, it, it, there would have to be uh, probably have to be prosecutions. Uh, we're talking. Well, may I ask we're you talking why, senior figures in the Tory I, Party committing some very serious criminal don't offences. Don't you have like what they call a get out of jail free card? That I'm would be this kind of intel that they would be threatened by, so they shouldn't have put you in jail to begin with. <laughs> well, some would say that it was a very silly move to put me in jail, bearing in mind what I know and right. what. Because bear, bear in mind, Same. politics is not for the benefit of viewers who may not understand politics. <laughs> Many of your viewers will, you do, but but not all your viewers will. Politics is not what you know, it's not who you know, it's what you know about whom. Mm. Again. Mm. Now, Theresa May was able to leverage her way into the Home Secretaryship through use of constructive use of intelligence, that some of which came from me. Now, Harry was also talking to other people in the intelligence community. He had very good Freemason links, and you know, there, were, there were various bits of intel. It's not just... That reminds me, are you Freemason? I'm not, no. But I have very friendly relations with the Masons. All right. Yes. I've had some very, I've had, I've had the odd, I've had the odd drinkies and the, you know, the odd little drinkies and the odd working drinkies and the Masons. Yes. Okay. So my, my contacts with the Masons have been cordial. But as, assuming they're not, uh, they're not the, the ones who are... Uh, oh, we're, we're talking English right Freemasons, not Scottish right. Nice Freemasons. Okay. The, yes. the good guys. The good guys, the white hats, yes. Not, right. not, not nasty Scottish right Freemasons, no. Okay. Uh, nice Freemasons. I only talk to nice Freemasons. That's interesting. You know, Trump, I guess, is related to the Scottish right, right in some way. Have He's very that? well connected. So you know that. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, Donald Trump is, <laughs> I don't know if he's read it. I, I, I copied what my book went into Trump Tower. All right. It was hand delivered to Trump Tower a few months well, ago. Well, maybe once this hits the airways that will uh, I sincerely get... hope Mr. Trump has read my book because if do anybody's going to assassinate him, it'll be the DVD. They assassinated right. Kennedy. All right. The yes. Germans will not be happy about his election. All They're right, extremely unhappy. Okay. Uh, so Trump is at risk. Uh, there's nothing specific, but yes, he, he needs yes. to be aware of the DVD. Now, fortunately... And God forbid you should warn anybody because you might be thrown in jail. Well, so. <laughs> well this is the problem. I mean, I'm in a very difficult position because you I've are. had one bogus bomb hoax charge. I can't... I, it, it's a bit difficult, but uh, all I can say is I, I, I really think he needs to read my book. I'm hoping he has done already. Okay. And so I'm hoping that the director this. of Mossad... Well, yes, indeed. Um, when the director of Mossad went over to see him, the new director, uh, went over to see him uh, last week, yes. uh, there was a little private briefing, and I'm hoping my book was mentioned. And if not, I sincerely hope the DVD were mentioned. Right. Trump is well informed. Uh, he's going to be a very good president, provided the Germans don't get him first.
talk about how, how this came about, because I think it's fascinating that a government would actually put you up on charges for, for, for warning them uh, about a possible, you know, so-called terrorist attack or attack of any kind. I mean, governments, one would think, would have a hotline and need people to yes. <laughs> report this sort of thing. And especially someone of your stature, a barrister, because yes. at the time you were, and in... I guess perhaps in the future we will be reinstated. I don't know. Well, I, I hope to be reinstated next year. I, I still, I still have my wig. I'm still a barrister. I'm on interim suspension. Yes. But the the prosecution case is falling apart, and uh, anticipate uh, fresh appeals in the new year. All right. So at this moment, let's start with your arrest. Yes. Uh, maybe set the scene by by telling yes. about the arrest, and I think it was shocking to you. It was. It was, it was so outlandish. It was completely outlandish. When, when word got round the Intelligence Committee, you know, some friends of mine, people who knew me in the Intelligence Committee, were falling about laughing. Yes. It was, it was such an extraordinary cock-up. But, of course, it wasn't a cock-up. It was deliberate. And it came from GO2 assets in the Cabinet Office. Now, people think that Britain's a functioning democracy. We're not, uh, Kerry. Uh, in practice, the government is run from the Cabinet Office, and that includes quangos, it includes the judiciary, it includes the police. Uh, and once the cabinet office order an arrest, an arrest will go down. Uh, most chief constables report in to the cabinet office. The Crown Prosecution Service, which controls criminal prosecutions in this country, does. And uh, uh, so most government ministers are just lightweights. They're, they're figureheads. They don't actually run their departments. The departments are run by the senior civil servant, who's normally called the permanent secretary. But I, I, I absolutely was not expecting to be arrested. In fact, I'd invited the op. When the police came round, I assumed they were special branch. And I've had a special branch visit me in the house before, you know, for sure. wanting intelligence or complaining about some intelligence I provided. I've had a special branch in my home at midnight where I used to live in Aylesbury. And when the police officer knocked at the door, I, I, my natural instinct was to invite them in because I work with law enforcement. I'm a good guy. I'm a white hat. So, you know, my first instinct was to come in and have a cup of tea. Yes. They were a bit surprised. They weren't normally offered cups of tea by people <laughs> they were about to arrest. Uh, and it, it did take, uh, I normally pick things up pretty quickly. I'm a fairly quick study, at least I think I am. Uh, but uh, it took me 30 seconds to grasp the fact that these, these idiots were serious. Right? <laughs> I thought, hang on, can't, can't possibly be serious. And, and of course, said, well, what, what are you arresting me for? I said, oh, well, you, you, you rang the Ministry of Defence yesterday. I said, well, no, the Ministry of Defence rang me. I said, oh, well, we're arresting you for a bomb hoax. Uh, they didn't tell me, in fact, initially. Um, they, they used the word malicious communication. I thought, well, what's this all about? I haven't been, haven't been okay. released about one o'clock on the Saturday morning. The officers actually drove me home. By that stage, the nuke had just been released. So it's obviously word went down from GO2 in the Cabinet Office. Somebody in the Cabinet Office sanctioned my release once the nuke was out of the way. So the way I picture it is that... Uh, the Jerrys, as, as we affectionately refer to the Germans, our community partners, the Jerrys, are removing the nuke. It goes out on a Type 21 U-boat off an old U-boat rendezvous yes. point in the uh, Blackwater Estuary in es Essex. The U-boat moves out, takes the weapon with it. The U-boat is surfaced but hull down, so only, only the conning tower is showing above the water. Uh, the depth of water in the Blackwater Estuary won't permit a Type 21 to go all the way up. Uh, uh, submerged. The U-boat is transferred to the sub. The NSA actually picked that up. As the nuke was transferred from, we think it was an ambulance that it was being carried in, as it was transferred from what we think was the ambulance to the U-boat, uh, you get a spike in radiation. Okay. Uh, we suspect that the warhead had been, or the device had been encased in water, which is a very good means of absorbing radiation. It's a very good, water's a good radiation shield. Mm. Uh, but in order to get it through the loading hatch of a Type 21 U-boat, you had to remove the water bath. What you have is a water bath. You have, you have your weapon, it has a casing, then you have an outer casing, and between the weapon casing and the outer casing, you fill with water. That's quite a good absorber of radiation. Uh, but the water bath and the outer casing, too, too big to go through the loading hatch of a Type 21, so the casing comes off, that then gives you a radiation spike. Uh -huh. And that's then picked up by an American satellite. So an American bird is not far away. Picks up a ra oh, radiation spike, plutonium, what's that doing there? <laughs> Very <laughs> interesting. The NSA yeah. weren't expecting plutonium 
in the Blackwater Estuary. Well, uh, you know, that this is interesting. I mean, it's almost like, you know, a movie. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right? look, this would be a great movie. Yeah. And, and so the question is, if the American satellite picked it up, uh, there's also the conversations you were having, right? Yes. On your phone. Now, do you have special security, you know, where, where your phone is not, they can't tap your phone, they can't tap your house, et cetera, et cetera, because the surveillance is pretty pervasive, especially here in England. Yes. Uh, G GCHQ will automatically record any phone call that I make. That, uh, any phone call, and, any digital and system. And myself as well. So, so. Exactly, yeah. So we, I'm used to that. But, of course, the good guys, being a white hat, the good guys also look after my phone lines. Sure. So if there's a tap on the phones that it shouldn't be there, then I will get a warning. Mm. But, yeah, my phones have always been looked after. Ah. Well, they have since, you know, since I got involved in the world of spies and spooks. Right. And, well, we want to get back into all that as well. Your history, I, used to have but... my, I used to have my house checked, too. I mean, I would have, uh, but it, it, it's not, it, it's fairly expensive. When the police came round, I assume they were special branch. And I've had a special branch visit me in the house before, you know, for sure. wanting intelligence or complaining about some intelligence I provided. I've had a special branch in my home at midnight where I used to live in Aylesbury. And when the police officer knocked at the door, I, I, my natural instinct was to invite them in because I work with law enforcement. I'm a good guy. I'm a white hat. So, you know, my first instinct was to come in and have a cup of tea. Geo 2 is the German operation in London. goes back to the end of World War II. A GO2 asset in the cabinet office had ordered my arrest, knew about the nuclear warhead and wanted me out of the way by very indirect means with the National Security Agency. And I got, well, by the Sunday afternoon, it was clear that, that whilst I'd been in custody, the nuke had been smuggled out. Uh, Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst is the German agency set up at the end of World War II. GO2 is their London operation. All right. So General Operations 2, it's based in a very discreet part of uh, MI6 headquarters at Vauxhall Cross. Hi, I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and today I am very excited to have a very interesting guest and a really lovely man. We're here with Michael Shrimpton. He's the author of Spy Hunter, which is a wonderful book that I've been reading, and found that he has some very interesting things to say in regard to history that relates to Britain, the United States, and really the rest of the world, but specifically also the relationship with a very secret organization within Germany. And we're going to go into all of that and see what, what Michael has to say. So Michael, welcome. It's, it's wonderful to be here with you. Well, thank you for inviting me on the show. Merry Christmas to you and your viewers. Oh, thank you very much, and to you as well. We are here in Britain, and you are a, a barrister. Uh, I suspended at the moment, uh, not able to practice my day job, banged up in prison for something I hadn't done. But, exactly. Yes. And, and, and we want to start off with that, actually. Yep. And uh, what I would like you to do is talk... It would cost about £1,000 a time to get the house completely electronically swept. Right. Except that a lot... Uh, you know, I have whistleblowers that tell me about the, the state of surveillance now. Yes. Which is far beyond what Edwin, Edward Snowden is, is talking about. Yes. I mean, it, it's fairly extensive, yes. Yeah, so um, basically uh, we're talking, uh, you know, a, a certain kind of um, physics and, uh, you know, they're, they're using and there's also the AI and, and all of this. Oh, the, the, any, any phone call I make on a digital system is going to be recorded. Right. And it'll do it from within about five, ten seconds of the call because the, it, it, whether I give my name or not, the voice print will pick up. But that works in my favour. It worked in my favour in my case. Because when the jury were being tampered with and when the GO2 acid on the jury were telling the jury about the fitting me up over the indecent images, 
of course, he referred to my name, and that immediately meant that uh, the calls were picked up. Right. Uh, because my name's a keyword. So the, the, the uh, Michael Shrimpton combined are keywords. Yes. So any, any conversation with my name in it is going to be recorded automatically. Right. And 99% of them may be totally boring conversations, and they may not even relate to this particular Michael Shrimpton. There is a more distinguished Michael Shrimpton who used to play cricket for New Zealand. <laughs> The far better cover drive than mine. But well, I'm sure they know the difference. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but at any rate, so the bottom line is that they were arresting you because even, even though there's proof that there was indeed a threat. Yes. Uh, and it was put in place, you're saying, by, you call it GA2? It's GO2, General GO2. Operations 2. It, the whole thing was done in bad faith. GO2 knew about the warhead. GO2 wanted to be out of the way while the warhead was being exfiltrated from the UK. They didn't want a live nuclear warhead. You know, they didn't, they didn't want to caught with a live nuclear warhead. Who set the, new, the warhead? If it oh, wasn't the GO2? German DVD. Okay. So it's Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst, who I write about in, that's the, the main topic of, of uh, research right. in Spy Hunter. Uh, Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst is the German agency set up at the end of World War II. GO2 is their London operation. All right. So general operations to it's based in a very discreet part of uh, MI6 headquarters of Vauxhall Cross. So, I mean, the, the interesting <coughs> thing here yeah. is, and that people need to realize, is that you're actually saying that MI5 is infiltrated. Yes. MI6 is infiltrated. Absolutely. GCHQ. Um, Absolutely. And basically also this goes for America as well. You're saying the highest levels of the British government are, yes. uh, are in on it. Yes. And um, and I would also say that you may have some good assets that backed you up with these phone calls telling you the status. Mm -hmm. But at the same time in America, you could have some people working against you because oh, yes. we, we believe there are. Uh, well, in essence, I mean, I you know who Jim Mars is. He talks about the Fourth yes. Reich and he's written about it. In the yeah, he did he malicious communications. Eventually, they said it was a bomb hoax. I just fell about laughing in the cell. You can't be serious. Oh, my God. It was absolutely ridiculous. But, of course, what had happened was that a GO2 asset in the Cabinet Office, I know who the asset was, but I can't name him or her on television, but a GO2 asset, that's GO2, the German operation in London, goes back to the end of World War II. A GO2 asset in the Cabinet Office had ordered my arrest, knew about the nuclear warhead, and wanted me out of the way. Whilst I was in Ellsbury Police Station, the first of the warheads was actually removed from the UK. I, wasn't, I was released when the warhead was out of the way. So in essence, you were giving them correct info. Oh, yes. Yeah. And how did you find out that the assets uh, the, or the nuclear weapon was removed? Oh, that was, that was uh, very quickly afterwards. I rang a CIA contact and I got confirmation I'd had initial confirmation, I was arrested on the Friday, and I'd had confirmation that the MOD rang me on the Thursday. I was arrested on the Friday afternoon, about two o'clock. Uh, I've been working on my book. Right. <laughs> I thought, ah, oh, finally, I got that one out of the way, I've handed that one over, I can carry on, catch up with my work. And uh, I was happily working away on my book, uh, tapping away on my computer. The the previous night, I'd got the first confirmation from an old-time CIA friend uh, who flew U-2s over Cuba during the missile crisis, heavy-duty CIA. Okay. And in the book, he's uh, referred to as Bill. Uh, Bill was the first pilot for the first selected pilot for the Powers flight. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't want to get shot down, so he, he pulled out. Uh, he'd actually trained Frank Powers. In the CIA, Powers is always known as Frank. All right. uh, and in fact, in the movie Bridge of Spies, you'll see my client, he was, because that's how I first got to know him as a client, uh, is there portrayed teaching the guys about the U2. Oh, is he? Uh, okay. he, was, he was an instructor. Right. He was an instructor to Frank Powers. And I rang, let's call him Bill. And I said, well, Bill, what's the story on this nuke? And he said, well, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 the effect of the conversation was a confirmation. Okay, there is a, uh, I'm on the right lines. There is a nuke in London. Uh, over the weekend, I was in touch with, by very indirect means, with the National Security Agency. And I got, well, by the Sunday afternoon, it was clear that, that whilst I'd been in custody, the nuke had been smuggled out by submarine. And then, then, of course, I briefed in Office of, National Intelli Office of Naval Intelligence, ONI, 
Uh, well, how is it possible? I mean, you must, the, this information, did it come to you? I mean, at this point, you were under, you were already, were you in prison right away? Or no, I was, re I was released, I was arrested at about 2.15 on a Friday afternoon. 